Hey, humans. Welcome to Read to Me, Matt Dunn. I'm Matt Dunn, and I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. We are in chapter 17. Or part two. Part two. If I can find it. Definitely in part two. Definitely so much part two that I can feel it. Part two. By Mary Shelley. <sighs> Mary Shelley would be so proud of me. Reading her book. The way I do. <laughs> she got to be like. Oh my god. I mean something. Part two. It was in the latter end of August that I departed to pass two years of exile. Elizabeth approved of the reasons of my departure and only regretted that she had not the same opportunities of enlarging her experience and cultivating her understanding. She's like, oh, I wish I could go travel the fucking world because, meh. Wish I can go get all the poon in the world. Meh. Fuck, I wish I can just wake up and not know what or who's beside me. Wouldn't even care. Gender, skin color. You know, it's just a couple of years of having mindless fun. I wish I can go travel the world. Hmm. That's what Elizabeth is thinking. She wept, however, as she bade me farewell and entreated me to return happy and tranquil. We all, said she, depend upon you, and if you are miserable, what must our, be our feelings? God, this sucks. That guy, it's got this whole family on his shoulders, and he's just, just fucking shit up. I threw myself into the carriage that was to convey me away hardly knowing whether I was whither whither I was going and careless of what was passing around i remembered only and it was with a bitter anguish that i reflect on it to order that my chemical instruments should be packed to go with me for i resolved to fulfill my promise while abroad and return if possible a free man free man not really a man are you though you're more like a lack of there piece of shit making dead things and walking away you're just irresponsible you created this mess from day one just blaming you i'm blaming you victor you derek you know <clears throat> I lost my fucking spot again. I just get in my, my mindless rants and, you know, how shit happens. Filled with dreary imaginations, I passed through my beautiful and, ma and majestic scenes. But my eyes were fixed and unobserving. I could only think of the born of my travels. And the work which was to occupy me while they endured. After some days spent in listless indulgence, during which I traversed many leagues, I arrived at Strasbourg, where I waited two fucking days for Clairvaux. In our time, this is like maybe two hours. Because, you know, maybe like in the afternoon, be like, oh, I got here in the, in the morning. Clairvaux is going to be here at around four. I got here on Tuesday. Clairvaux is going to be here uh, August. He came. Alas. How great was the contrast between us. He was alive to every new scene, joyful when he saw the beauties of the setting sun, and more happy when he beheld it rise and recommence a new day. He pointed out to me the shifting colors of the landscape. And the appearance of the sky. It's like, yo, look how uh, colorful that shit is. Yo, we're bros, right? Yeah, that, that sunset is beautiful, bro. 
Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. This is what it is to live, he cried. Now I enjoy existence. But you, my dear Frankenstein, wherefore are you desponding and sorrowful? Wherefore? Wherefore indeed? In truth, I was occupied by gloomy thoughts and neither saw the descent of the evening star nor the golden sunrise reflected in the Rhine. And you, my friend, would be far more amused with the journal of Clairvaux, who observed the scenery with an eye of feeling and delight, than to listen to my reflections. I, a miserable wretch, haunted by a curse that shut up every avenue to enjoyment. We had agreed to descend the Rhine in a boat from Strasbourg to Rotterdam, whence we might take shipping for London. During this voyage, we passed by many willowy islands and saw several beautiful towns. We stayed a day at Mannheim, and on the 5th from our departure from Strasbourg, arrived at Mayence. The course of the Rhine below the Mayence became much more picturesque. The river descends rapidly and winds become hills. Winds become hills, not high but steep and of beautiful form. We saw many ruined castles standing on the edge of precipices surrounded by black woods, high and inaccessible. This part of the Rhine, indeed, presents a singularly variegated, variegated landscape. In one spot, you viewed rugged hills, ruined castles, overlooking tremendous precipices, with the dark Rhine rushing beneath. <gasps> You're looking to the left. You're looking to the right. You got the things and you got the things. And you got the river and the boot and you get the raven and the blah, blah, blah. And on the sudden turn of a promontory, flourishing vineyard, vineyards, with green slopping, sloping banks and a meaning river, meaning man mandering river, and populous towns occupying the scene. What a glorious moment it must be. Totally, totally, totally. It's so beautiful. We traveled at the time of the vintage and heard the song of the laborers as we glided down the stream. Even I, depressed in mind and my spirits continually agitated by gloomy feelings, even I was pleased. Totally. By totally atonement. I lay at the bottom of the boat, and as I gazed on the cloudless blue sky, I seemed to drink in a tranquility to which I had long been a stranger. And if there were my sensations, who can describe those of Henry? Mm, holy shit. He felt as if he had been transported to fairyland and enjoyed a happiness seldom tasted by man. I have seen it! He said, the most uh, beautiful scenes of my own country. I have visited the lakes of Lucerne and Uri, where the snowy mountains descend most perpendicularly to the water, casting black and in impenetrable shadows, which would cause a gloomy and mournful appearance were it not for the most verdant islands and relieve the eye by the gay appearance. I have seen the lake agitated by a tempest, tempest when the wind tore up whirlwinds of water and gave you an idea of what the water spout must be on the great ocean and the waves dash with fury on the base of the mountains where the priest and his mistress were overwhelmed by an avalanche, and where the dying voices are still said to be heard amid the pauses of the nightly winds. I have seen the mountains of La Valleas, 
and the Pais de la de Boada. They're so me. But this country, Victor. This fucking country. I goddamn motherfucking tell you, Victor. This fucking country pleases me more than all those wonders. The mountains of Switzerland are more majestic and strange. But there is a charm in the banks of this divine river that I never before saw equal. Look at the castle which overhangs you, pre hang, overhangs yon, yon precipices, precipice, and also that on the island, almost concealed among the foliage of those lovely trees. And now the group of laborers coming from among their vines and the village half hid in the recess of the mountains. Get a look at this. All the shit, Victor. Get a look at it. That's what he's like doing. He's like, da da da. Oh. Surely the spirit that inhabits and guards this place has a soul more in harmony with man than those who pile the glaciers or retire to the inaccessible peaks of the mountains of our own country. Clairvaux, beloved friend. This is like Frankenstein internally. Dr. Frankenstein, internal Frankenstein. Clairvaux. Beloved friend, even now it delights me to record your words and to dwell on the praise of which you are so immensely deserving. He was a being formed in the very poetry of nature. His wild and enthusiastic imaginations was chastened by the sensibility of his heart. His soul overflowed with the ardent affection, and his friendship was of that devoted and wondrous nature that the worldly-minded teach us to look for only in the imagination. Get it? But even human sympathies were not sufficient to satisfy my eager mind. The scenery of eternal nature, which others regard only with the admiration he loved with ardent. Ardent. So we got a little poem here at the bottom of this. Right after the word ardor. The sounding terror haunted the sounding cataract haunted him like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to him appetite a feeling like ooh a feeling and a love that had no need for a remote charm but thought supplied or any interest unborrowed from the eye Uh, it says Wor Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey. That's the title or something like that. Wow, that was great. Those are amazing. It had something to do with the story. Now we're back to the story again. Uh, I guess this is Victor thinking about uh, Hector. What's his name? What's his, but his friend's name? Clairval. And where does he now exist in this gentle and loving, lovely being lost forever? His, has his mind so rep replete with ideas, imaginations, fanciful and magnificent, magnificent, which formed a world whose existence depended on the life of its creator? Has this mind perished? Does it now only exist in my memory? No, it is not thus. Your form so divinely wrought and beaming with beauty has decayed, but your spirit still visits and consoles your unhappy friend. Pardon this gush of sorrow, these ineffectual, ineffectual words are but a slight tribute to the unexampled worth of Henry. But they soothed my heart, unflowing with the anguish which his remembrance creates. I will proceed with my tale. So I guess Clairvaux died or is died because he's like, ah, 
Henry, beyond Cologne, we descended to the plains of Holland, and we resol resolved to post the remainder of our way, for the wind was contrary, and the stream of the river was too gentle to aid us. Our journey here lost in the interest arising from the beautiful scenery, but we arrived in a few days at Rotterdam, whence we proceeded by, the, by sea to England. It was on a clear morning in the latter days of December that I first saw the white cliffs of Britain. The banks of the Thames presented a new scene. They were flat, but fertile, and almost every town was marked by the resemblance, resemblance of some story. We saw a Tilbury fort and remembered the Spanish Armada, Gravesend, Woolrich, Greenwich, places which I had heard of even in my country. At length we saw the numer numerous steeples of London, St. Paul's towering above all, and the tower famed in English, in English history. That is chapter 17. Well, what a wondrous chapter. That was, it was a pretty boring chapter, honestly. Basically, uh, too long didn't read. This is uh, his trip from uh, Geneva to England, and he's with his friend, and he's just like, I'm depressed, and I can't tell anybody about it. Uh, but, you know, his friend's like, this is the best time of my life. And then he's, he's like, uh, my friend's dead. And you're like, but he, he's telling the story when he's alive. So now we know he's dead. And I guess unless someone else is dead, who's Henry? Henry the kid? Nah. Henry wasn't the kid's name. The kid's name was like... George. Anyway, if you'd like for me to keep reading, please check out some more of my videos. Give me a thumbs up. Uh, like. Subscribe. And write some comments down below, and I promise, I promise, we will be friends. Because we already are. It's that simple. We are friends. Friends. Thanks.